We are on the very bottom of Daf Lamed Ches Amid Beis. We were learning yesterday in Mishnah that the Gemara says has an apparent contradiction from the Reisha to the Seifa. We're talking about who is in control of a woman's uh, uh, assets when she is waiting to do Yibum. The first part of the Mishnah, the Reisha had said that when a woman is waiting to do Yibum, the Yavam, even though there's Zika between the two of them, does not have any control over her real estate holdings. And therefore, if both Beishamah and Beisilil agree that if she wants to sell those assets, she has every right to do so. Now, that would not be the case if she was actually married to him. If she was actually married to him, she would have to get his permission before selling the property. Um, the Seifa seems to be saying something contrary to that. And the Seifa talks about a case where she dies. If she dies, then Beishamai are of the opinion that her, all of her real estate holdings are divided equally between her, um, her Yavam and her family. And that seems to be a contradiction. So the Gemara said, you know, if in the Reisha she was in complete control of her assets, why in the Seifa do Beishamai hold that uh, the Yavam gets half of those assets? He divides them equally with her family, with her heirs. So we had seen two answers to this question. One was from Ula, and the other one was from Rabbah. And today we're going to see two other answers to that question, one from Abaya and one from Rava. So the Gemara says, Abaya Omar, Reisha dunaflu la kishehi shomeres yavam, Seifa dunaflu la kishehi tachtov debaal. Abaya says the difference between the Reisha and the Seifa is as follows. The Reisha is talking about where the real estate assets came to her after her husband's death, after Ruvain died. Now that she's waiting to do Yibum, Shim and the Yavam cannot control those assets that come to her after she was married to Ruvain. And the reason is very simple. Zika is not strong enough to attach itself, to cause Shimon to attach himself in some controlling way over her real estate. However, if she had inherited that real estate while she was still married to Ruvain, since Ruvain was in com complete control of those holdings, Shimon, who is coming as his surrogate, also has a greater sense of control over those assets. He doesn't have complete control like Ruvain did, but he has partial control because of the Zika. And therefore, the Gemara clarifies, Ukesavar Abaye Yado Ki Yada. And Abaya is of the opinion that <clears throat> his hand is as powerful as her hand. Now, what, what does that mean? We're good, there's actually a machlokes as far as when a husband and a wife are married, who has more power over her real estate holdings? And um, um, Beis Hillel is of the opinion that yado ki yada, that when a man and a woman are married, then his hand is as powerful as her hand, and like Rashi says, velo yoser, and not more power. Hilkach kishemes ve'en liyabamba elazika yado geria miyada, and therefore, the, the Marsha is speaking out, according to Beis Hillel, who argue with Beis Shammai in our Mishnah, Beis Shammai say that they get to split it equally between the Yavim and her heirs, but Beis Hillel are of the opinion that no, the real estate still stays in her possession, in the possession of her family. So Abayah, the Gemara is just clarifying that according to Abaya, the reason for that is, is because if she were actually married to a man, and, and uh, then they would have equal control. So therefore, when there's only Zika between her and the Yavam, she has complete control. According to Beit Shammai, they say, Yado Adifa Miyada, that Beit Shammai hold that when a husband and a wife are married, he has more control over her holdings, and therefore when there's just Zika between her and the Yavam, their holdings are equal, and that's why the Yavam divides it with her heirs. Amar Le Rava. So Rava now contests what Abaya has just suggested. Because Rava says, I have a hard time believing that according to Beis Hillel, when a man and a wife are fully married, yado ki yada, they have equal rights. Everyone agrees, even Beis Hillel agrees, that when a man and a wife are fully married, uh, then he has, the husband has more control over the wife, over her holdings. And therefore, you can't tell me that when there's Zika, the husband and the wife are, um, uh, that sh she's going to maintain control, according to Beis Hillel. 
And therefore, I have a totally different interpretation. And this is now, like I mentioned, interpretation number four. And that is that both the Reisha and the Seifa are talking about when she gains her holdings after her husband dies, when she's waiting to do Yibum. Reisha de lo avad ba maimer, Seifa de Seifa de avad ba maimer. And therefore, what's the difference? Why in the Reisha does she have full control, and in the Seifa she only has partial control? The answer is, is the Reisha is talking about a case where the, the Yavim did not give her a maimer. And the Seifa is talking about a case where the Yavim gave her a maimer. Now, I want to remind you, that we had this, lo- this long-standing machlokas between Beis Shammai and Beis what a mimer accomplishes. According to Beis Hillel, a mimer is only rabbinic in nature. It doesn't really create a biblical marriage at all. According to Beis Shammai, that's not true. According to Beis Shammai, a mimer creates a biblical marriage between a Yavim and a Yavama. And now we'll be able to understand better the machlokas between Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel in the safe of our Mishnah. Because if the Seif is talking about where he presented her with a mimer, we could certainly understand why Beis Shammai say that a husband has control now, at least partially, over her assets, where Beis Hillel says, no, a mimer doesn't give him any further control over her assets. And therefore, um, Rava must hold that according to Beis Shammai, when you give a woman a mimer, it makes her completely your arusa for all intensive purposes. She's your wife completely. But as far as being a nesua to control her assets, it only gives you partial control. And that's why, according to Beis Shammai, the Yavim splits the assets with her heirs. <clears throat> now, vaday arusa lidchos bitsara, v'safek nesua lachlok binachasim. Now, what do we mean that it, she makes your, it, the mimer, according to Beis Shammai, makes her an absolute arusa? Well, if you remember, the classic case that we talked about a mimer, according to Beit Shammai, was the case of three brothers, Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi. Ruvain and Shimon are married to two sisters, and Levi's a single guy. Ruvain dies, and his wife falls to Yibum for Levi, and Levi, instead of doing Yibum, gives her a mimer. After Levi gives her a mimer, Shimon dies. Now, if the mimer does nothing biblically, then Reuven would not allow to continue his marriage to the first to the first widow, right? Because of Achaz Zekukasa, like we've learned many times before. So, but Beis Shammai say, no, the Mimer does work. It works to deflect the problem of a sister now coming into a Zika, and therefore the Mimer completely works. But it only works as far as making her his wife as an Arusa, but not to have complete control over her real estate holdings, and therefore, you only have partial control. It makes it like a suffix nesua, only partially in control. Itmar mishmei de Rebbe Elazar kavasei de Rava, the itmar mishmei de Rebbe Yossi, the Rebbe Chanina kavasei de Abaya. So now remember, we have this machlokus between Abaya and Rava now. Abaya says the difference between the Reisha and the Seifa is the Reisha is talking about where her real estate came to her after her husband's death, and the Seifa is where the real estate came to her during her marriage. And according to Rava, the difference between the Reisha and the Seifa is the Reisha, there was no Mimer, and the Seifa, there was a Mimer. And all the Gemara is now saying is, is that Rabbi Lazar and Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Chanina, who are Amoroyim from Eretz Yisrael, have the same machlokus between Abayin and Rava. Ra, uh, Rabbi um, Elazar says like Abaye, uh, I'm sorry, like Rava rather, and Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Chanina says like Abaye. So the Gemara says, Umi Amar Rabbi Elazar Hachi, how can you tell me that Rabbi Elazar agrees with Rava as far as the potency of a mimer? But didn't Rebbe Lazar say that a mimer, even according to Beis Shammai, is not a full marriage? It doesn't help to make a full marriage. All it does is to, is to deflect a sister who falls, falls for Yibam after you've given a mimer. But it's not a full marriage. So how can you tell me that according to Rebbe Lazar, it is successful enough to give the Yavim partial holdings on her real estate? So the Gemara says, you're right, you'll have to epoch, you'll have to switch it. And it's not Rabbi Lazar who holds like Rav, it's Rabbi Lazar who holds like Abaye, and Rabbi Yossi Rabbi Chanina holds like Rava. That's one answer. The Ibayis Eimah Lo'olam Lo'tepoch. 
Another answer is you don't have to reverse the positions. Rabbi Lozer Taka holds like Rava, that even though he said, even though Rabbi Lozer said that a maimer is not a real full marriage, but nevertheless he wasn't addressing the issue of real estate. Amr lecha Rabbi Lozer ki amri ana de lo sagi la beget ela de boi nomi chalitza, but lach lok ben achasim de lo kani mi amri. He says when I said that according to Beis Shammai a maimer is not a full marriage, it was only vis-a-vis marital issues, meaning that if a man gives a woman a maimer, even according to Beis Shammai, it does help to deflect the tzara. But for another marital aspect, it's not considered a full marriage, such that if he wants to call it off after giving her a maimer, if she was fully married, all, have, all he would have to do is give her a get. But I hold that even Beis Shammai would agree that he has to give her both a get and chalitza. But I wasn't ever addressing the issue of control, controlling her assets. So I could very possibly agree with Rava that a mimer does accomplish somewhat of a control of her assets. Amar of Papa, do you could demasnisim kavase de abaya, the afogaf de kashemesa. Now, Rav Papa makes a bit of a cryptic statement. He says, first of all, I'd like to support Abaya based on the language of our Mishnah. I think that Abaya's interpretation fits best with the language of our Mishnah. Remember, what does Abaya say? That the difference between the Reisha and the Seifa is the Reisha is where she acquired her assets after her husband's death, and the Seifa is where she acquired the assets during her husband's death. The language of our Mishnah indicates that, even though there's still a question on Abaya as far as why the Mishnah talks about her death, and we'll get to that in just a second. Now, Diketani, Nechasim HaNichnasim V'yotzim Ima, because the Mishnah's language in the Seifa is assets that come in and go out with her. Now, my Nichnasim U'mayotzim, Lav Nichnasim L'Rishu Sabal V'yotzim L'Rishu Sabal, L'Rishu Sa'av. What that implies is is that we're talking about a case where the assets came to her when she was under her husband's tutelage, meaning when she was married is when the real estate came to her in the, in the seifa, and then her husband died and left the husband's control and reverted back to her father's control. So you see very clearly from the language of the Mishnah that we're talking about real estate holdings that came to her while she was still married to her husband. And that's the language that is indicative of Abaya's thesis. And what's the, and, and, we, and Rav Papa said, the language indicates like Abaya, even though it's a bit of a kasha on him. What's the kasha on him? Because according to you, Abaye, there was no reason for the Mishnah to change the case from the Reisha to the Seifa. What, what, remember, we talked about this yesterday. The Mishnah changed. It's the, the Reisha was talking about a case when the Yavama is still alive, and it says that she has full control over her assets. And the Seifa talks about a case of after she's dead, who actually takes possession of her real estate holdings. But according to you, Abaye, that's not, there's no reason to change the case. The Seifa could have also talked about a case of a Yavama who is still alive, and the question is, since the holdings came to her while she was married to her husband, who controls the assets while she's still alive, as far as the Kenyan Peros, as far as, granted, her name is on the title, but who controls, who gets the dividends from those from that real estate while she's still alive. And the machlokas would have been just as cogent and clear had you not changed the case. And that's why it's a bit shver and abaya why the Mishnah changes the case midstream. Nevertheless, v'sulo midi. But we're not going further with this discussion because we've just demonstrated that the language of the Mishnah supports abaya. Sometimes you ever feel like you're talking to a wall? <laughs> I think I'm talking to a wall right now because it's too quiet in this room and I don't feel that many, that many people are attentive. Uh, so okay. let's, let's put on our thinking caps, Rabbi Sai. I'll talk after. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> nice try. Now, Harehi Hichvichulei. The next thing that our Mishnah said was, and this was the last line of our Mishnah, the Mishnah had said, that once you marry her, once a Yava marries a Yavama through Yibum, she is his full wife in all respects. The only difference is that when it comes time to pay out her kasuva, it's paid out from the estate of the decedent, not from the, the estate of the Yava. So the question the Gemara is going to ask is, Lamai Hilchasa, what are the halachic ramifications of that statement, Harehi ke'ishta l'chol she is his full wife. Amar Rabbi Yossi Bar Chanina Lomar Shemegarsha Begetu Machzira. 
This is to teach me that if the Yavim wants to divorce her after doing Yibum, he doesn't have to do anything other than give her a get. And furthermore, if he divorces her and he wants to remarry her, that's perfectly within his purview. So Megar should beget Pshita. The Gemara says, isn't that obvious? Obviously, he did Yibum, so she's his full wife. The Torah says it's his wife. The Gemara says, no. Salka daita chamina holo chasiv ulo kacha lo li isha v'yibima amar rachmana v'adayin yivume harishon aleha b'chalitza in beget lo kamash melon. I would have thought, because of the language of the Pasuk, and we had seen this before in Yivamas, because the Torah says, he shall take her to him as a wife and do yibum. The implication is that even after he has taken her as a wife, she is still called a yivama. And therefore there might still be a, a, a lingering stigma of her being a yivama even after marriage, which would imply that if he wants to get rid of her, he has to give her chalitza. So kamash malan, that no, if he wants to divorce her, he gives her a get. So machzir abshita the fact that he's allowed to remarry her if he divorces her, that also should see, seem fairly obvious. And that too is not obvious, because Because look, what does the Torah do? The Torah takes a woman who is naturally an erva to him, it's his eishas ach, and it says, we're giving you a heter to marry her. But why? Because there's a mitzvah to build up your brother's house. So I might have thought, well, if you marry her and then you divorce her, you no longer have the mitzvah. So maybe it's also <coughs> she reverts back to her status of an erva and you're not allowed to remarry her. So therefore, kamash malan, that you are allowed to marry her. So correct the Gemara, ve'ema hachanami. So the Gemara's question is, well, maybe taka, that should be the halacha. Maybe the halacha should be that if you do yibam and then divorce her, you shouldn't be allowed to marry her. So amar kra ula kachalo li'isha. That's why the Torah says, you shall t- he shall take her to him as a wife. That teaches me that once he takes her as a wife, she's completely his wife, and therefore if he divorces her, he's allowed to remarry her. Yes? Well, yeah, I can answer that. Basically, the zika always remains, except for Khalidza cutting the zika, right? Well, once he marries her, there's no longer zika. No, I'm saying if he divorces her... He still has that original Zika. No, that's precisely what the Gemara is saying. Don't think. The Gemara is saying that's actually not the case. So what, So how does he remarry her then? He remarries her because he's re, the Torah permanently lifted the okay. Isser of Eishasach. Oh, the Eishasach. Ah, okay. okay. He's lifted. Okay. Okay. There's no difference if they've had a child or not. Makes no difference. Uvilvad shetehei kesuvasa v'chulei. Provided that the only difference between a regular wife and a Yibum wife is that with the Yibum wife, the payment of the Ksuva comes out of the decedent's assets. My Taima, the Gemara asks, what's the reason? Because Isha Hiknulo Min Hashamayim, that the Torah basically says, this is your wife. So if the Torah tells me this is your wife, it's not going to saddle me with the additional requirement of having to pay for it. God basically designated the wife to me, but not that I have to indebt myself in order to marry her. So the Gemara says, and what are the ramifications, by the way? Normally, if I have a ksuva that I give my wife, so she's basically one of my creditors, and therefore I'm not allowed to impoverish my estate. I can't deplete my estate. I always have to leave enough money in my estate to pay out her ksuva because she's my creditor. If I do deplete my estate, she can always go to the people who I've sold my estate to and extract it from them when it's time to collect. But in this case, no, because she's getting the ksuva from the decedent's estate, I can totally deplete my estate. So, vi less la min harishon ta kino la misheni kideshalo te he kala bein of lozia. But then the Gemara says one more proviso. If there was no money in the estate of the decedent, then we do still require him to give her a ksuva. It's, it's midrabanan anyway. And the reason is, is because there always has to be a financial disincentive for a man to divorce his wife. That's one of the reasons why Chazal instituted the ksuva in the first place. They basically said, we want to make it difficult for you to divorce a woman. We want to give a woman security that she's not going to have, be easily discarded, a throwaway. So therefore, in order to make that sure that that doesn't happen, the woman always has to have the assurance of aksuva. So in, in a case where the decedent had assets, so then the aksuva comes from his estate. Um, and, but when the, the decedent had no assets, we still require the yavam to cover the aksuva. So if she, when does she get the aksuva? Upon divorce or death. 
of the, of the oven. Th- of, of, the oven. Of the oven. So she doesn't collect from her first husband, even though she's her first husband died. Correct. Yeah. Because you only collect exu at the termination of the marriage. This is a continuation of her marriage from, from her first husband. Okay, let's go on to the next Mishnah. Mitzvah begodol liyabein. That the next Mishnah is, is much more straightforward. Our brains need to relax a little bit. There's a mitzvah for the oldest brother to do yibo. Okay, we've learned this before. The first brother has first rights of refusal. Lo ratzah mahalchan al kol ha'achim. If the first brother doesn't want to, then we go to the other brothers. Lo ratzu chazun eitzel gadol va'omrim lo alecha mitzvah o chalot zayabeim. And then if all of the brothers refuse, we go back to the eldest brother and we say to him, it's your mitzvah, it's your call, either do chalitza or do yibum. Tala b'katan ha'chiyag deal. Now let's say the eldest brother says, you know what, I'd love to accommodate you, but we, you know, we have a brother who's under bar mitzvah, and I have a good feeling that when he becomes bar mitzvah, he's going to want to do yibum. So it's better for, you to, to, for her to have yibum from the boy than to get chalitza from me. That's his argument. That's what he wants to suggest. He says, wait for the kid to become bar mitzvah, and then he'll take care of it. Or, let's say, uvigodol achiyovum medina sayam shoshota. Or let's say he has another argument. The oldest brother says, but I'm really not the oldest brother. I'm the oldest brother that's at home. But I have an elder brother who's overseas. So wait for him to come home. Or I have an elder brother who's in an institution because he's not of sound mind. So in that case, in all of those cases, ain't shomen lo. We don't hearken to his, to his protest. Ela omen lo alecha mitzvah ochalot zayabem. And we say to him, sorry. We don't delay doing the performance of a mitzvah because of something that's going to happen. It's now the time. We're not going to let this woman hang for, uh, for an indefinite period of time. You either do chalitz or do yibam, fish or cut bait, as they say. This is Yehuda. Like, what? This is Yehuda, the whole thing. But you wanted her weight. That's, oh, very good. That's right. Okay. Is there a significance to the fact that they say, O chalitz, O yabim, instead of O yabim, O chalitz? Possibly. We're going to see this Gemara. Today's Gemara is going to talk about which is preferable. The Gemara now says, Itmar, bias katan v'chalitzas gadol. Now, what if there's the following two possibilities? Either the eldest brother is prepared to do chalitza, or a younger brother, we're not talking about, a, when we say the word katan in our Gemara today, we're, we don't mean a child under bar mitzvah. We mean a younger brother who's 20 years old, right? Or, some, you know, he's above age, okay? So we have an older brother who's prepared to do chalitza. We have a younger brother who's prepared to do yibo. Which one takes precedence? So Pligi Bar Rabbi Yochan and Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, Chadom Rabbi Yas Katan Adifa, and Chadom Rachalitza Skadol Adifa. So this is a machlokas. One Amora says it's better to get the chalitza from the older brother, and the other one says better to get yibum from the younger brother. So Man Do Amar Bias Katan Adifa the Hamitzvah be yibum. If you hold better to get yibum from the younger kid is because the mitzvah is primarily yibum. It's only a fallback to do chalitza. And Oman Domer Chalitzas Gadol Adifa B'Makam Gadol Bias Katan Lav Klum. The other opinion is no. It's always the oldest brother's prerogative to do to act first, and therefore the younger brother's yibum is nothing or is insubstantial compared to an older brother's chalitza. Now it's done. Let's subject that machlokus to our Mishnah. Lo ratzam achzun al kol ha'achin. If the oldest brother doesn't want, and none of the brothers want, we go, what do we do? So first, so the oldest brother doesn't want, we go to the to go to the younger brothers. So my lav lo ratzal yabim el alachlo. So katani mahalchen eitz el ha'achin shmami na bias katan adifa. So the Mishnah implies that if he doesn't want to do yibum, but he's only prepared to do chalit, so we offer it to the younger kids. So we see, therefore, that it's better to do yibum with the younger brother than to do chalitza with the eldest brother. So it's a kasha. So the Gemara says, lo. Lo ratza lachlotz vilo liyabim. Really, our Mishnah is talking about a case where the guy is surfing. He doesn't want to do anything. He's not even prepared to come to Beistin. He doesn't want to do chalitza or yibum. And that's when we go to the other brothers. So the, the, then the Gemara says, well, if that's the case, the kavosa gabi ha'achin lo ratzu lo lachlotz vilo liyabim, then the parallel would be that we go to the other brothers, and then the Mishnah goes on to say they also don't want to do. So what does it mean they also don't want to do? That means they also don't want to do anything, just like the elder brother. So if that's the case, then amai chosun eitzel hagodol lemichpayi lechpayi lididu. So then why do we have to go back in that case, like Rashi says, why do we have to be matriach the bastin? So, like, why, he says, amai chosun eitzel gadol. 
Why do we have to go back to the to the eldest brother at that point when no one wants to do anything? Why do we have to be matriach the basin to go back to the eldest brother? None of these guys, all they're, they're all bums. They don't want to do anything. So if that's the case, then the, when the basin gets to the last brother, and he also doesn't want to do anything, let's just force him to give her chalitza. Why do we have to go all the way back to the first brother? So the Gemara answer is, the mitzvah The answer is, is because since the mitzvah comes to him first, to the eldest brother, even though he's only gonna, we're only going to be able to force him to do chalitza, we force him over the other brothers. Okay, so we don't have a raya one way or the other from our Mishnah. You can read the Mishnah either way. Tanan. Let's go to the next part of the Mishnah. Tala bikatan achiyagdil ain shomen lo. That if the eldest brother says, I'm, you know what, I don't want to do it, but wait till my brother becomes bar mitzvah age, and he'll do yibo. So, the ibiyas katan adifa amai ain shomen lo. Nintar dilma gadol miyabe. And if you're telling me that it's better for a younger brother to do yibo than an older brother to do chalitza, the kasha is on that person. Why wouldn't you wait for the kid to become bar mitzvah? Let him, let's wait for him to grow up, and maybe he'll do yibum. So the Gemara says, So the Gemara says, well, then why don't, according to that argument, why does the Mishnah also say that we don't wait for an older brother to come back from overseas? The fact, and, and maybe he'll do yibum. So, like, why don't we wait? So, Ella kol shehuye mitzvah lo mashina. The answer is, even if you say that it's preferable for a younger brother to do yibum over an older brother doing chalitza, we're still not going to delay the mitzvah. We don't wait at all. We just look at the best available pool of brothers that are present before us right now, and we force them to make a decision. Now, Ista Amri, now others learn that the machlokas between these two Amoraim is not about whether it's better to do chalitza with the older versus yibum with the younger. That everyone would, would, would argue, according to the second version, everyone agrees that it's always better to do yibum over chalitza. Some say that the machlokas is as follows. The machlokas is regarding the chalitza of a younger brother, and the, 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 the machlokas is as follows. Chalitza's katan the chalitza's gadol pligi ba Rabbi Yochanan ve Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Chad amar chalitza's gadol adifa ve chad amar ki hadadi ninu. The machlokas is, is there a preference if all the brothers are not going to do yibum? Is there a preference for the eldest brother to do chalitza, or does it not make a difference and anyone can do chalitza? That's the machlokas. Okay? So, man do amar chalitza skodol adifa do ha mitzvah begodol. Ve idoch ki amrinu mitzvah begodol inin yibum aval inin chalitza ka hadod ininu. So, machlokas is very simple. If you tell me that, yes, dafka, we, we want to go to the eldest brother to do chalitza, it's because the, the, the mitzvah is always with the oldest brother, either yibum or chalitza. And the other mandomer says, no, the only time that there's a stafka, a mitzvah for the eldest brother is for yibum, but if he's not, no one's prepared to do yibum, then it doesn't matter who does the chalitza. So tonight, now let's subject that machlokas to our Mishnah. Lo ratzu chazun eitzel gadol. That if they don't, if none of them want, we go back to the eldest brother. <coughs> so my love, lo ratzu liyabim el alachlotz, ukatani chazun eitzel gadol, shmami na chalitzas gadol adifa. So the simple import of our Mishnah is, would be, it seems to be, is that none of the brothers want to do Yibam, they're all, they're all prepared to do Chalitza, and yet we still go back to the eldest brother to do the Chalitza. So we can prove from the language of our Mishnah that even if they're all pre- only going to do Chalitza, you still have a mitzvah to go to the oldest brother, that the Chalitza of the oldest brother is still the priority. So it's a kash on the other man to Omar. So the Gemara says, lo. Lo ratzu, lo lachlotz, lo liyabem. That really our mission is talking about where they're all, you know, surf bums. They're all not interested in doing anything. No one's doing anything. And that's why we go back to the eldest brother. So to kavase gabe gado, lo ratzu, lo lachlotz, lo liyabem. So if that's the case, then you're telling me the eldest brother didn't want to do yibo merchalitza. So we go back to, to, to all the other brothers. They also don't want to do yibum or chalitza. So ella amai chosrin eitzel gadol lemichpayu lichpayu liditu. So then, why, if we've already heard from all of them that they don't want to do anything, why then is it necessary to go back to the eldest brother? Look, if they're all bums, let's just why why be matriach the basedin? Let's just force the last person that we spoke to to go ahead and do chalitza. The more answer is kevin the mitzvah lady de ramia lady de kaifina, and the answer is is because since the mitzvah is primarily with him. The eldest brother, then we tell the eldest brother to go ahead and do chalitza. 
In other words, when everyone is recalcitrant, when everyone is refusing, so then everyone would agree that we go back to the eldest brother and tell him, make up your mind, you've got to decide. But if, let's say, the, it, it's very possible that if the last brother says, I'm willing to do chalitza, it could be that from our Mishnah you have no raya that you still have to go back to the eldest brother. It could be that you could just accept the chalitza of the youngest guy. So therefore we have no raya one way or the other. Tashma. But, but now, look at, now look at the next part of the Mishnah. Tala begadol ad medina sayam ein shomilo. That if the eldest brother says, you know what, I have an, uh, an even older brother who's overseas, we don't listen to him. So v'yisal kadaita chalitza skadol adifa amayin shomilo ninter dilma asi v'chalitz. And if you're going to tell me that it always is the mitzvah primarily to do it with the eldest brother, why not wait for him? But according to that argument, what about the other part of the Mishnah, which says that if he claims that he's got a younger brother who just has to get bar mitzvah, he'll do yibam, why not wait? Don't we all acknowledge that yibam is a greater mitzvah than chalitza? So, And the answer, therefore, is that we don't delay a mitzvah. And therefore... You're right. There may be a priority for the oldest brother to do chalitza when everyone only wants to do chalitza. There also may be a priority to do yibum over chalitza, even with the younger brother. But if those people are not present in front of us, we never delay the mitzvah. We always say, chaparayim, right now, what's going to happen? Order and the, the or, way it would work is, in the final analysis of the Gemara is, yibum always trumps chalitza, regardless who's willing to do it. And if everyone only wants to do chalitza, you go to the oldest brother. So if the what? eldest is approached and says, I don't want to do yibum, but I'll do chalitza right now, we stop him in order to ask the next Correct. brother for yibum. So Correct. We, we, first, yibum. we first try yibum with the other brothers. What if the woman wants to wait? Let's say it's a younger brother and she says, no, I, I, I'd rather wait. I'll wait. It could be. It could be that in that case we would consent to wait, uh-huh. as long as everyone is a consenting party. Uh-huh. The, but the Gemara seems to be implying that it's when she's having shpilkas, that's when we don't wait. I agree with you. Now, it's, it's not muchach, but it sounds that way. Tanan hasa. Now let's look at another mission. Mitzvah yibum kodemes le mitzvah chalitza. Barishona, shahi miskavim l'shei mitzvah. But achshav, shahi miskavim l'shei mitzvah, amru mitzvah chalitza kodemes le mitzvah yibum. The, the Mishnah says, and we're going to see this later on, we see this, it's a Mishnah in Ksuvis as well, and in Bechoros, that originally, in the olden days, when people's intentions were pure and honorable, we always used to tell a person, better that you should do yibum over chalitza. But now that people have degraded in their, in, their, um, in their honor, in their integrity, and people now are, their intentions when they have yibum is not for the sake of the mitzvah, but rather for their own personal gratification, we therefore tell people, it's better that you should do chalitza than do yibum. Now, Amar Rav, Ein Kofin. Rav says, even though that's what the Mishnah says, nevertheless, if today two people, the Yavam and the Yavama, want to do Yibum, we don't force them to do Chalitza. In other words, even nowadays we say, our preference is for you to do Chalitza. But if the both of you really want to do Yibum, we won't stop you. Okay? For Sephardim it is. For Sephardim it is. For Ashkenazim, we're a little bit tougher. Um, How do you prove if it's Erlach or not? <laughs> I guess that's the question. There's no way. There's no, no no way to put money to hold. Yeah. Now, Kiasu Lakame Dirav Iboyis Chalots Iboyis Yabeim Bididach Tala Rachmana, and therefore, based on that, Rav said when when a couple would come to him, a Yavam and a Yavama would come to him, he would tell the people, "Listen, if you want to do Chalitza, go ahead. If you want to do Yibum, go ahead. It's all up to you." Because the Torah says, Because the Torah says that if, if he doesn't want, so you see that the Torah places the decision on his desires. The Afra of Yehuda Savar in Kofin, and Rav Yehuda also said that even though nowadays we prefer to do Chalitza, but if the couple really wants to do Yibum, then we don't stop them from doing Yibum. And how do we know this? Midaskin Rav Yehuda begitted the Chalitza, because we, we once examined a, a, a writ, uh, sort of like a, a statement of rec- the recordings of the Bastin that Rav Yehuda wrote down after he presided over a, uh, the, a, the, a, a, a case like this. He wrote it as follows. He, wrote a, over, he presided over a chalitza, and he wrote as follows. Eich plonis bas ploni akarvas yus ploni yavama kadmonu lebeidina. That 
there was once a case where a woman comes forward with her brother-in-law to the Beistin, inhu, and we ID'd him, and that he was the brother of her, the maternal, paternal brother of her d- deceased husband, the Amri lay, and we said to him as follows: Eat savis liabim yabeim, the ilo itlo la raglech diamina. And we said to him, if you want to do yibum, you have every right to do so. But if you don't want to do yibum, stick out your your right foot because you get ready for chalitza. The itla le ragla diamina, the shara sine me al raglohe, and as the rich continues, he stuck out his right foot. And she took off his shoe off of his foot. The yarkas be'anpohe roka de mischazil lebeidina al ara, and she spit onto the ground in front of his foot, spit hole that was recognizable to the basin. Because as we're going to see later on, there's actually a halachic measurement as far as how much saliva has to come out of her mouth. It has to be visible to the to the basin. Okay, so the fact that Rav Yehuda recorded it in this way. Um, is an indication that Rav Yehuda did give the option of Yibum, even though he was living in a generation where people's honor was in, put into question. The Rabbi Chia Bar Ivya Messiah Ba Mishmed the Rav Yehuda, the Akrinu Madichsib, the Sefer Arise the Moshe. And Rabbi Chia Bar uh, Ivya also claims that on that piece of paper that came out of Rav Yehuda's based in, that it also said that we read, you know, as part of the Chalitza ceremony, we read the Psukim of Yibam and Chalitza as is recorded in the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu. So now the Gemara says, Ishtamo de Inhu, let's go back to that word that we ID'd him, says Rav Yehuda in that, in that piece of paper. What does it mean that we ID'd him? So, Pligi Barav Acha Veravina, Chad Omar Be'edim, the Chad Omar Afilu Karav Afilu Isha. That one says that we ID'd him with witnesses, that, we, that witnesses came along and were able to identify him as the brother. And, and therefore, like Rashi says, Shetzarach Lohav Yishnei Edim, Shuhu Achi Hames Me'aviv. And the other Mando Amar says that no, it wasn't for the purposes of IDing him, verifying his identity. It was really for the purpose of publicizing what was going on. And therefore, the Hilchasa Gluye Milsa Ba'almahu Va'afilu Kara Va'afilu Isha. And therefore, it's not necessary for these people to be too kosher Eidim. It could be a woman, it could be a, a family member, is all that's necessary in order to accompany the couple to the, to the base. That's what Gluye Milsa. We just want to reveal it. We ID'd him through revelation, not through an actual testimony of Adam. Next, Barishona Shahayu Miskabim Lashay Mitzvah, Mitzvah Sibim Kodemis Lemitzvah Chalitza, the Ash of Shay Miskabim Lashay Mitzvah, Amra Mitzvah Chalitza, Kodemis Lemitzvah Sibim. Originally, the rabbi said when people had honorable intentions, we told them it's better to do Yibim than Chalitza. But nowadays, when people's intentions are not as honorable, we say that it's better to do Chalitza than Yibim. Amar Rami Bar Chama, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Chazru Lomar, Mitzvah Yibim Kodemes Le Mitzvah Chalitza. So comes along Rami Bar Chama and he says, even, even despite that Mishnah, the rabbis once again changed the Halacha, and later they said, better that you should do Yibim than Chalitza. So Amar Le Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak, Achshur Dari, so Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak asks incredulously, what do you mean? People got better over time? That's not true. We know that the generations, each succeeding generation, gets worse and worse. So you can't tell me that people reverted to becoming more honorable at a later date. So me'ikara savri lo ka'aba shol, lo'basof savri lo So the Gemara says, no, you're right. People's intentions were just as dishonorable in the later generation, but what happened was is that they changed the p'sak halacha. Originally, they paskin like Rebbe Abba, who says that any time your intentions are dishonorable, you should not do yibum. And then they changed the psaq to the Chachamim, who said that even if your intentions are dishonorable, it's still better to do yibum. And this is the Machlokas. The Tanya, Abishol Omer, HaKonis es yivim to l'shem noi, l'shem ishus, l'shem dover acher, ki ilu pogeya be'erva v'karav ani be'enai lios havlad mamzer. He says a very dramatic statement, very uh, you know, very powerful. He says that if a man does yibum for ulterior motives, either because he, he, she's beautiful, or because he needs a wife, he needs a companion, or for any other ulterior motive other than the mitzvah, then it seems to me almost like this man is is 
being intimate with an erva, and therefore it's almost as if the child that they have is a, through their union is almost like a mamzer. So Rabbi Abba is like really harsh in the way that he says your intentions have to be pure. But the Chachamim Omrim Yevamo Yavo Aleha Mikol Makom, and the Chachamim disagree and they say no, the mitzvah of Yibum is a mitzvah of Yibum, no matter what your intentions are. Yevamo Yavo Aleha. So the mitzvah of Yibum is a derisa. Yes. So how is it that the Chachamim and Rabbanim are able to push it aside, so to speak, and say, we do chalitza, we don't do yibum? Because the Torah prescribes chalitza also. The Torah prescribes but, both yibum and chalitza. Right, chalitza is the fallback. Chalitza is the fallback, but according to Abishol, it's only the fallback when your intentions are honorable. Isn't this like mitzvahs srichas kavano, mitzvahs less srichas kavano? It almost sounds like that. There's a lot of Torah discussed about what Abishol's rationale is and how he can extrapolate from the psukim that your intentions have to be honorable, since when do we find this by any other mitzvah? But he is able to read into the psukim, it's not clear how at this point, he reads into the psukim that the only time that, that chalitza is the fallback is only when you're, in te- you're capable of having doing it l'shem shamayim. But if you're not capable of doing it l'shem shamayim, then the chalitza is the l'chad well, chilo. for the protection of the woman as well, and... Uh, that would be that's that seems to be the Torah's intention, right? But if if you're not capable of doing it l'shem mitzvah yibum because she's a knockout or because you're lonely, then like the halacha is that you're better to off doing chalitza. That's what Abba Shol says. Every marriage is like that. <laughs> Why do you marry the woman? Well, that's the whole point. The yibum is different. Yeah. Yibum is different because the Torah says that the reason for yibum is to establish a name for your deceased brother, not for any other reason. Yeah. So mantana laha detanu rabbanan. So now the Gemara says, okay, let's look at the following brisa and say, see who the author is. Yavamu yavo aleha mitzvah. That the when the Torah says the yavam shall be intimate with her, it means that that's the mitzvah. Shabbat chila haisa alav bichlal heter nesra v'chazra v'hutra. So we look at this girl. When she was a single girl before she ever got married at all, she was permitted to this guy, and if he wanted to, he could marry her. And whatever, whatever he wanted. Then his brother marries her, and she becomes usher to him. Then his brother dies, and now Shimon is allowed to marry her again. You might think that she's just as permitted as she was before Ruvain married her. And therefore the Torah says, no, he shall, he shall come to her, which means that there's a special mitzvah. So the que- that's the end of the brisa. The question is, what does the brisa mean, and who's the author? So Mantana, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak Bar Avdimi Abashol Hivahachikamer. This is authored by Abashol, and you read it as follows: Yevamo Yavo Aleha Mitzvah Shevitchila Haisa Lav Bichlal Heter Ratzel L'Shem Noi Konsa Ratzel L'Shum Ishus Konsa. That originally this girl, when she was single, Shimon could have married her, and it wouldn't have mattered what his intentions were. It, if he fell in love with her, if he thought she was beautiful, if he was lonely, it wouldn't matter. It was his option. He could marry her, not marry her. Nasra chazra v'hutra, yachol tachzol hatera harishon. Now that his brother Ruvain married her, and then Ruvain died, and now she becomes permitted again to him, you might think that it's, she has the same status as before, that it doesn't matter what his intentions are. Even if he only wants to marry her because she's beautiful, it's still okay. No. Tamulomer yavamo yavo aleha lemitzvah. And that's why the Torah says no. The Yavam shall do Yibam with her, not just to marry her Stam like a single woman, but it has to be L'shem Mitzvah. And therefore, this Mishnah goes according to Abba Shol, that if all, you can only do the Mitzvah of Yibam if your intentions are pure. That's where you see, that's where Abba Shol extracts it from the, from the Pasuk. But Rava disagrees. Rava Omar, Afilu Tema Rabban and Vahachi Kamar. Rava says... You could learn that our mission, that this brisa goes according to the chachamim, and you would read it differently. You read it as follows: Yevamo yavo aleha mitzvah, that the guy shall Shimon will do yibum, and that's a mitzvah. Shabatchila haisa bichlal heter ratza kansa ratza eno kansa. That originally this girl was single and available, and he could do whatever he wanted. He could either marry her or not marry her. Nesra chazer v'hutra yachol tachzul lehetera harishon ratza kansa ratza eno kansa. That you might think that once his brother Ruvain marries her and then Ruvain dies and she now is available again, it's also his option. He can do whatever he wants, either marry her or leave her alone. So the Gemara says, wait a minute. Ratza eno kansa hagida ve bichdi tepok? 
What are you talking about? What do you mean? It's his option. He can either marry her or leave her alone. How could he leave her alone? There's a Zika there. He's got to do something. She can't go away without anything. So, Ella, Ema, Ratzah, Kontzah, Ratzah, No, what I, what I mean to say is, the Brisa really means is that you might think that she goes back to being available again, and therefore it's purely at his discretion. If he wants to marry her, he can marry her. If he wants to give her chalitza, give her chalitza and let her go. So, Tamal Omar, Yavamo, Yavo, Aleha, Mitzvah. And therefore, the, the Pasuk says, that's what the end of the punchline of the Brisa is, the Yavam shall do a mitzvah of Yibam, which means it's not like it was before when she was a single girl, that it's purely up to you what, to decide whether you want to marry her or not. No. Now there's an imperative in the Torah that there's a mitzvah for you to marry her. There's no, no one can say there's a mitzvah for me to marry Dafka, that girl, right? But by Yibam, yes, there is a mitzvah to marry Dafka, that girl. And that's what the Torah is telling you. Even according to the Chachamim, the Brisa goes. And the Brisa is basically saying that don't think it's purely at your discretion. You really have to try and make it work. There's a mitzvah of Yibam no matter what. So therefore, the Brisa could go according to Abishol, according to one interpretation, or it could go to the Chachamim according to another interpretation. This is what we'll pick it up in Ritz Hashem.